Amen. Well, I pray it has been a blessing. Um, we want to look tonight at uh, how the kingdom comes to bear upon us as believers. We are really at the end. I mentioned uh, last week, I think we'd have two more lessons. And so uh, looking at tonight, how the kingdom is at work in believers. And then next week, we'll do a conclusion by way of some charts that Graham Goldsworthy puts in his book that I find very, very helpful. I'm going to have Karen run those off for us, and I'll walk us through those. And I think they'll, they'll be helpful to you as well. Uh, but we've walk through the entire kingdom of the Old Testament and the the redemption history, and then we saw last week how it came to fulfillment in Christ. So now the question before us tonight is, how does this um, come to bear upon believers? What do we learn from redemptive history about how God saves? So look at the top of your notes, and I'll jump right in. I want to make a couple of key points tonight. First of all, in Israel's history, from Abraham to Solomon, Several events emerge that are interpreted by the Word of God as redemptive events. That's what we've been learning. The events of biblical history are redemptive events. It's redemptive history, right? And what has arisen from that is a pattern of redemption. In other words, we've learned not just what happens to Israel. You can't read the Old Testament as just a history book. That's Israel, we're the church. That's Old Testament, we're New Testament. What we've learned is... On the pages of Israel's history, on the pages of biblical history, these events are redemptive and they show exactly how God saves, right? It's in pictures, it's in shadows, it's in types. So as we talked about in Sunday school this morning, you can't see it in its fullness until Christ comes. So naturally, it's a, we need to realize that it's sort of in an elementary presentation. But nevertheless, there are significant things taking place in history. Israel's history that show us how God saves, what it means to be saved, what it means to be a member of the kingdom of God. And what we learn as we walk through history, look at letter A, we learn that redemption begins in God, right? Redemption begins in God with sovereign election. It stands upon an unconditional covenant of divine promises, right? God takes the initiative. If God doesn't save, no one gets saved. If God doesn't come to us, we don't make our way to him, right? There's no going up. This is the significance, of course, one of the significances of Jacob's ladder, right? The ladder that was descended from heaven to earth, right? And John, you know, we read in John chapter 2, Christ says, the son of man ascending and descending, right, and by the angels. And so that ladder comes down from heaven to earth. God condescends, he comes down to save. If God didn't bring a ladder down and send his son to redeem, nobody would make their way up. Every religion in the world outside of Christianity is an attempt to build a ladder, a tower of Babel. And it's a failure because you can never reach the heavens, you can never reach God because you can't stand before God in an acceptable manner on your own, right? We need salvation, we need a savior. So redemption begins with God and when it comes to rescuing sinners, notice what it involves. It involves captivity. Why? Because that's where sinners are, right? That's where God finds us. Remember, this is the significance of Egypt, right? They were already, they were already Abraham's descendants. The covenant was made with Abraham before Egypt, remember? Genesis 12, 15, 17, before Egypt, before the, before the time in Egypt, and certainly before the oppression and the slavery. Why did God send Joseph's or Jacob's family into Egypt? Because it's there that redemption will get its biggest and greatest picture, that it's a, it's a rescue, it's a deliverance, and the real condition of every sinner is captivity. So what's the best place to show that? What's the best place to type that out in history? Put them in a foreign land under oppression as slaves. And now you have a situation from which a historical deliverance can talk about. This is what salvation is. We're all in an Egypt. We're all in spiritual bondage. Ephesians 2. And so God comes. When he comes, he comes to captives and he comes to set them free. So just think in your mind. How does the New Testament describe Christ's work, right? Luke 4, right, quoting from Isaiah, right? Jesus says, today this is fulfilled in your presence, right? The Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is is upon me, and I have come to what? Set the captives free. The people people in the synagogue that day would have immediately gone right back to Egypt because that's where captivity was preeminently seemed to be the case. That's where their fathers were in captivity. And, of course, Babylon, but you don't have the same, right, coming home from Babylon isn't a redemption. It's a restoration because they went there to be purged. So even the, even the rescue and the, and the return from Babylon 
isn't described in biblical history in the same way as coming out of Egypt. That's true captivity. Redemption doesn't precede that. Redemption comes into that situation, right? Whereas redemption precedes Babylon. They go there as the people of God, right? Because of their idolatry. They come out purged and they are restored to the land of God that already is, the presence of God that already is, right? You know, see how it's different? So we see these things now in, in biblical history and we understand them better. So when God comes to say, we've learned how God does this, it involves a captivity, it involves an exodus, it involves covenant regulation. Think of the Ten Commandments, think of Mount Sinai and how long they were there and all the laws and rules. Covenant regulation, God's people will be regulated by the covenant. It involves entry into and possession of the land. In other words, God's bringing us not just into a wilderness, not just out of Egypt, but into something else, into his place, the place he's chosen for us, and that's what Canaan serves as a picture of. It involves the rule of David. God has a king, right? Remember as far back as Deuteronomy 17, provisions were made for a king. In fact, you remember what God said to Abram, that from Sarai will come a king, even there. Right In Genesis, there's mention of Sarah having a king in her offspring, already looking forward to David and, of course, ultimately Christ. So belonging to God, this, this rescuing of sinners, it involves the rule of a king, bringing them under the king. It involves temple worship. God will be worshipped. And, of course, God is worshipped everywhere, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but in the Old Testament... You have the temple, the location, a specific place, Mount Zion, temple worship. But what does this show us, right? We can worship in any building. We can gather together as the church, but we're worshiping the one true God by the means that he has appointed. And so that's that centrality. So temple worship, and of course it involves Jerusalem, which is the city of God. And that, that isn't even really seen as clearly here in the New Testament. That really isn't seen to be the case until the consummation when we're all brought together in the one place where God dwells with man, of course, in Revelation 22. So this is what we see. Redemption begins with God's sovereign election, stands upon a covenant of, of divine promises, and it involves all these particulars. That's what Israel's history, that's what redemptive history has taught us. This is how God saves. This is what he saves from. This is how he saves and this is into which he's bringing his saved people. This is what he has in mind for them, right? And therefore, secondly, we've also learned from Israel's history that redemption is released from slavery and a binding unto God as his covenant people, right? He comes into Egypt, and what does he say? I am the Lord your God, and I've come to rescue you, not just to set you free that you can go about your own business, but I've set you free to be mine, right? You're my treasured possession. We'll look at that in a moment in Exodus 19. And so redemption is a release and a binding. That means redemption is more than release from bondage. It's a life regulated by the covenant and fellowship with God. So redemption then is what? Exit and entry. That's what redemption is. An exit from bondage and an entry into the kingdom of God. And then we have our theme, God's people in God's place with God's presence for God's glory. Right? Let's go to Colossians 1 and look even in just a couple of verses. Right? Paul doesn't need much time or space to capture these images. In Colossians 1, think of all that we just described, this captivity, exodus, covenant, the land, etc. Think of those images and then come to Colossians 1. Verses 13 and 14. Actually, I'll back up to verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. So that idea of inheritance is brought forward. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Just think in those couple of verses how many Old Testament images right, are assumed. Paul's assuming you understand all of the reference that each of those words have in mind. And then look at verses 21 and 22. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Again, all of the images encapsulated in just a couple of verses. All of the things we've been learning through Israel's history. 
Redemption involves an exit and an entry. Look at letter C. This is uh, one way in which Goldsworthy summarizes the entire Bible. What God originally generated, or created, but he uses the word generated because of its repetition, what God originally generated in Eden, Genesis 1 and 2, was degenerated by the fall, Genesis 3, and is being regenerated by Christ in redemption, Genesis 3 to Revelation 22. Right? That's the Bible. And that's exactly what we've seen in the big picture, right? Adam and God with Adam and Eve in the garden. Sin enters, and you have the fall. What is God doing? What's Remember, this is not the right word. God doesn't respond to anything, right? But what's God's response to the fall? Redemption, right? In other words, the fall is not going to thwart his plan. In fact, we learn that the fall is part of his plan, right? Because it shows the inability of man to save himself by his own righteousness, and it necessitates, not that God's under any necessity, but it necessitates the coming of Christ, right? It foreshadows, right? It lays the groundwork for the coming of God to save on his own. He will come, right? Remember what the Bible says, the Lord looked down to see if there was any who was standing in the gap. If there was any, there was none. So what did the Lord say? I will put forth my own arm. I will work salvation by myself. That's what God does, right? Because man can't do it. And so you have the, the whole Bible there, right? You have creation, you have the fall, and then regeneration. The rest of the Bible leading to the end, the rest of history, is all about what God is doing to bring his kingdom, the very kingdom he intended in the beginning, and cannot be thwarted by sin, but will be brought about even through, through the fall. Because following the fall, of course, is the redemption that Christ brings. So this expression of the kingdom of God, what we learn in, as we go through the Old Testament, what we learn is that God's kingdom is coming. God's kingdom is coming, and it gives man two options, right? It gives man two options. Either they reject the promises of God and perish in their bondage. In other words, stay in Egypt. Or like the first generation that murmured and complained, go back to Egypt. Remember what they said? Let's raise up some of this. Moses, we don't know where he is. He's gone. He's been gone up on the mountain. Let's appoint someone else to take us back. You have that choice. Go back. You're welcome to leave, right? Even the church is a voluntary society. You can leave anytime you want, right? right? It's voluntary. So this is the option held out for man. Remember what Moses says? I put before you blessing and curse. Right? And so you're welcome. You're welcome to reject the promises of God and perish in your bondage because there's no other option there. If you reject God's deliverance, God's redemption, then you will perish because you're in bondage by nature. Or, which we hope by God's grace, we take God at his word, we believe in his promises, we hope in the fulfillment of those promises, and we respond in love, gratitude, and obedience. Now think about it. That's exactly what God told Israel. He went into Egypt. He brought them out. Right? He redeemed them as a nation, which means you have wheat and chaff. Right? You have wheat and tares. Right? There's a, there's a rabble among them, even Moses says. Right? So they're not all saved. They're not all going to be saved. In fact, the first generation falls away. But God takes them as a nation and plucks them out and puts them in his land while brings them into the wilderness and then the second generation into the land, and God lays before them through Moses, blessing and curse, right? Taking you into the land, you're my people, I'm bringing you into my church. Now walk before me. Trust me, love me, obey me, right? And the good thing is that when we look to God and say, Lord, have mercy, he has mercy. When we look to God and say, Lord, help, I believe, help my unbelief, he helps, right? Because God enables, he answers the cries. When we finally realize, think of the Sunday school this morning, right? When we finally realize our inability, God gives ability. But as long as we, we assume our own ability and we don't need God, then we make ourselves like unto God, right? And we find ourselves idolaters and we perish. And so throughout these redemptive events of, all, of the Old Testament, what do we've learned? There's a pattern of redemption. We'll come back to that in our third part. But in the second part, I want to show us, I want to highlight something else. Throughout redemptive history, what is God doing? He is showing how he saves, why salvation is needed, and how he accomplishes it. But he's also revealing himself. God also is revealing himself. And then he sends his prophets to interpret those events as redemptive, revelatory, and covenantal. So let's turn to Deuteronomy. Let's trace these verses. Remember what we said before. This is the pattern. God says he's going to do something. God does that very thing, 
And then he interprets it and tells you what he did. In other words, he tells you what it means. God never leaves us guessing. He prophesies and declares he's going to do something. He does it, and then he writes about it afterwards and says, this is what I did, and this is what it means. So Deuteronomy 4, verses 35 to 40. Interestingly, we, it's a wonderful testimony here to the unity of the church, right, and the covenantal nature of the church, even as Moses writes to the second generation, here speaks to the second generation, and he says, to you, when it was really to their fathers, right, because the fathers have perished. Verse 35, to you, he says, it was shown that you might know that the Lord is God. There is no other besides him. Now, what was shown? The Lord went into Egypt by signs and wonders that got them out. God said he was going to do that because that's what he told Mo, that's what he told Abraham in Genesis 15 he was going to do. Your offspring will be in a foreign land and then I will go get them, right? I'll judge the Amorites. I'll go get them and bring them out. And so that's what he's going to do. Now, he did it. Now, all these years later, 40 years later, what does God do? He interprets it. So if we look back and say, why did God do that? Was that just because the Lord wanted to bring us out of Egypt? No. What we're told is that, is a, that was a redemptive event. But it was also a revelatory event. God is revealing himself. So verse 35, to you it was shown that you might know that the Lord is God. There was no other besides him. Out of heaven he let you hear his voice, Mount Sinai, that he might discipline you. That's what that was for. See how God's interpreting his events. And on earth he let you see his great fire. And you heard his words out of the midst of the fire. And because he loved your fathers and chose their offspring after them, it's all based in the covenant, and brought you out of Egypt with his own presence by his great power, driving out before you nations greater and mightier than you to bring you in, to give you their land for an inheritance as it is this day. Know therefore today and lay it to your heart that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. There is no other. Therefore, You shall keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may belong, that you may prolong your days in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for all time. So you see the overlap. You look at redemptive history. God is revealing in those events a pattern of redemption. He's also revealing in those events himself. That he is the Lord, that he is God that he is covenantal, that he is faithful. He brought them out of Egypt in fulfillment of his promise to Abraham 430 years earlier. That was the basis for it, which obviously is rooted in his own heart. Look at Deuteronomy 6. (coughs) Deuteronomy 6, we read this the other day. Verse 10, And when the Lord your God, when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you, with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees you did not plant. When you eat and are full, take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God. Notice what's being revealed. God is jealous. No one has done for you what God did for you. And he's jealous about his honor, his glory, his worship, his due. What you owe to God, you owe to nobody else. Because nobody has done for you what God has done. Therefore, give him his due. Love, trust, honor, obedience, worship. All those belong to the Lord by right. By your creation, but now by your redemption. And we could go on. And then in Deuteronomy 7, we saw the same thing we read this morning, right? The Lord has chosen you above all people of the earth, not because you were greater in number or for any other reason, but because the Lord loves you. Deuteronomy 11, same thing, verses 1 to 17. You can read that on your own, a glorious passage that testifies. Again, God's care, God's faithfulness. Why did the Lord do this? That you might know that he is the Lord. He's revealing himself in these events Because he alone is the one who can save. Now, look at letter A. What does this mean? What I'm trying to get across here is that it's interesting. When you read the Bible, the Bible is not a theological textbook, right? You can read systematic theologies. There's a ton out there, a ton of really good ones, in fact. 
The Bible isn't a systematic theology. It doesn't give us lectures or chapters even on God's attributes. Instead, God reveals himself. He reveals his attributes. He reveals his character and who he is. He reveals himself in the midst of redemptive, covenantal, historical events. So think about all that we've traced through the Old Testament. What have we learned about God? Now, we've seen redemptive events, but what have those redemptive events declared to us about God? We've learned that God is creator. We've learned that God is judge. We've learned that God is the covenant maker, that he is redeemer. He is warrior. Right? Think of Exodus 15. He is king. We've also learned that God is holy, that God is righteous, that God is almighty, God is omnipresent, God is loving, God is merciful, God is gracious, God is wrathful, God is altogether awesome. Redemptive history gives us a pattern of redemption and reveals the Redeemer himself. Right? Think about it just for a moment. Right? God's theological revelations are in history. That's the importance of the Bible. We need to read the Bible. God shows himself to us. Just ask yourself, where did God, in redemptive history, where did God reveal to us that he's sovereign? There's a number of places, but what can you think of? What does God say in redemptive history? By an event, how does he show he is sovereign? And in fact, he declares that sovereignty, right? Remember, he does it, and then he interprets it. So think to yourself. Any suggestions? Where did God reveal sovereignty? Hmm? Plagues, right? That's a great place. He's sovereign over all their gods. He is God, right? And in fact, we read later, right, that the Lord says he judged the gods of Egypt, right? Another example, where does God show sovereignty? He's not moved by anybody. He makes his own decisions. Where does he reveal sovereignty? Huh? It was a sovereign act over creation, right? He's sovereign, to, right? Even the wind and the sea obey him, right? Think of it even as they said of Jesus, who then is this man, right? Right? How about what we learned this morning? Jacob and Esau, right? While they were yet in the womb, before they had done either good or bad, yet God said the younger shall serve, or the older shall serve the younger. He chose Jacob, right? And, as, and that's in Genesis. And then in Malachi, what does he say? Jacob, have I loved? Esau, have I hated? Now, what's interesting, just take that example. All right? God shows his sovereignty. God doesn't say, I'm sovereign. He just does it. Right? And that declares sovereignty. But then think of how Paul interprets it in Romans 9. Right? Who are you to answer, right? to, to question God? The Lord has the right over the same clay to make vessels for honor and vessels for dishonor. God is sovereign over creation over mankind, right? Where does God reveal his holiness? What comes to your mind? Think about the holiness of God. Where do we see God's holiness revealed in redemptive history? In the temple. The temple. Solomon's prayer of the temple. Okay, Solomon's prayer of the temple, right? Beautiful, beautiful instance. Love 1 Kings 8, right? How, da how about Nadab and Abihu? Were you? Nadab and Abihu. These were priests, and we're thinking, there's only a few guys, right? Aaron only has so many sons. And they're preparing, they're being consecrated and, and ordained and prepared to lead this, you know, massive nation. And two of them die just like that. Why? Because I will be sanctified by those who draw. In other words, I will be regarded as holy by those who draw near to me. So God acts, right, an event to reveal something about himself. God doesn't give us theological lectures. He carries out deeds because of who he is, right? God is. God does what he is, right? He reflects who he is. What? The flood, God's holiness. I, I think, so, yeah, th those in my mind, justice, right? God's anger, God's wrath. God hates sin, right? He will by no means clear the guilty. It's part of his name, remember? Exodus 34, 6 and 7 is part of his name. Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Even in Jude, Sodom and Gomorrah comes back. Isaiah 1, Sodom and Gomorrah. Hosea, Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? Sodom and Gomorrah are those pinnacle spots in history, both of them together, of course. But that's that point in history in Genesis 19 where God declares once and for all, he's just, he's vengeful, he's wrathful, 
in a just way, of course, against sin. And the guilty will perish. And we say, well, that was the Old Testament God. That's not the New Testament God. But what happened to Ananias and Sapphira? Right? God there again in the New Testament reveals that he is just, he is holy. And you could go on, think of mercy. Have we not seen mercy shown repeatedly in Hosea? Right? Where does God show his triunity? Right? Where does God show his triunity? A couple of key places. Creation. Hmm? Creation, right? Absolutely seen creation. Christ's baptism. Christ's baptism, right? Christ in the water, the Father speaking from heaven, the Spirit descending. The transfiguration, right? Now, again, you think of something like the Trinity. God's always been triune. But you can't reveal the triunity of God until all three persons are on board in one sense, right? Until Christ comes. You can foreshadow it. You can hint at it, right? Like in Genesis 1, right? When the Lord determines to create and then speaks and the Spirit hovers over the water and brings it about. You see all three persons. Let us make man in our image, right? There's a hint there. But it's not until Christ comes, the third person that takes on flesh, the second person in the Trinity, of course, but he takes on flesh and the Spirit is outpoured, Pentecost. You see the triunity of God that was always there, but now actually is on the pages of redemptive history. So we could go on and on. You think of God's grace, God's love. Look at the cross, right? The love of God writ large, right? God's love. So that's what we need to understand as we read. You know, we began this whole study by saying, how do we read the Old Testament as Christian scripture. And this is how we do it, right? We look at it declaring redemptive history, a pattern of redemption, and it's revealing the revealing God all throughout. Now look at letter B. I've got a chain of a chain of descriptives here as one unfolds to the other. All right? Since history, all history, but particularly biblical history, of course, since history is his story, it can't but be revelatory. Right? Remember what we said when we started this study? The number one actor in all of history is God. Because it's his story. It's his history. It's redemptive history. Right? And so it's revelatory. God's revealing himself. He always has been, always is, always will be. And he hasn't changed. But who he is is revealed on the pages of the scripture, but on the pages of history. So it can't but be revelatory. And since it's revelatory, it can't but be covenantal. Because that's what God's doing. He begins by creating man in covenant. And when man falls, he shows up with another covenant, the covenant of grace, right? Which itself was born out of the covenant of redemption from all eternity. So what God has been doing with creation from before creation, but certainly at the beginning of creation, it's been with regard to the covenant. And so it can't, can't but be covenantal. God, what does God reveal? If it's revelatory, what is, he, what is he revealing? That he's the covenant-making, covenant-keeping God, and he's going to save a covenant people by the covenant. Right? And since it's covenantal, it can't but be redemptive. Right? Primarily because we're fallen, so we have to be redeemed. Right? Remember? Redemption begins with our captivity. It can't but be redemptive. And since it's redemptive, it can't but be Christological because there's only one redeemer. There is one redeemer. Right? The only redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it has to be about Christ. And since it's Christological, and Christ is the one who is at the end of it all, on the throne, as God, in the flesh, for all eternity, the head of the church, then it can't but be teleological, which is a word that means purposeful toward a decreed end point, and eschatological, which means relative to the end of all things, the intrusion of eternity, and the coming of the kingdom of God. So all of history, and especially redemptive history, it's all about Christ. And since it's all about Christ, it's all moving toward an end point. It's all moving toward the end and consummation of all things. The kingdom that God had in mind in the beginning, that seemed to be thwarted by sin, but is being rescued and redeemed by Christ, that very kingdom is coming. And it can't be thwarted at all. God will have his kingdom because he has his king. And he has set him up on his holy hill. And Christ will be the king at the end of it all, over all things, and given to the church as head. So the two things that we've laid out then, redemptive history gives us a pattern of redemption, and redemptive history reveals God and his covenantal kingdom-saving work. And now thirdly and finally tonight, redemptive history then is at work in believers. Believers. 
So here I want us to see and just recognize quickly in the remainder of our time how the pattern that we've seen, how that is worked out in our lives. Because now that Christ has come, all of that foreshadow now, that foreshadowing, all that comes to bear on us. So just glance at the, at the rest of the page there and look at what we see. Right? What do we learn about our salvation? If I were to say, if we were to just work, not that we can work from just a New Testament perspective, right? We, we're tied to the Old Testament. That's the whole point we've been making. But if we were to just work from a New Testament perspective, what do we learn about our salvation? It begins in election. Ephesians 1, 4, right? John 6, nobody can come to me, right? But the Father draws him. All that the Father has given to me will come to me, right? And so what we learn is our salvation begins in an eternal election, if we were to flip the pages of the Bible and go to the Old Testament, what do we learn from the pattern of redemption? How does salvation begin? Election, right? And Noah found favor in God's eyes, right? That's Genesis 6. And then by the time you get to Genesis 12, we, we're trace, tracing the line from Shem to Terah to Abram. And then all of a sudden, chapter 12, we're just told out of nowhere. And the Lord appeared to Abram and declared to him, right? Follow me. Come to a land that I will take you, right? And I'll make you a blessing to all the nations. Where does that promise come from? Why Abram? There's no reason given because there is no reason. It's just God chose Abram. And all of the genealogy leading up to Abram is, is because God is getting to Abram. You look at all the genealogy. God is skipping so many people. He's skipping generations. He's skipping this person, that person. None of it matters. He wants you to know how, we, how he got from Adam to Abram. And then we'll move from Abram to David. And then we'll move to David, from David to Christ. Go to Matthew 1. That's all Matthew 1 does, right? And he says there's 7 and 7 and 14 and 14. Well, not really. But if you leave a few out, you can find 14, 14, 14, right? But the point is, God, doesn't, God is saying none of all those matter. What matters is, let me show you how I got to Christ and that I've been bringing Christ along since the beginning. That I've been preparing for this moment, if you will. So we learn about our election. Salvation begins in election. What's the next thing we learn? Think of Romans 8. Right? We learn that those who are elect are called. Right? They're called. At some point, they're called. And that's exactly what happens in the pattern of redemption. Abraham was God's choice. And what did God do? He came to Abram and he called him. Right? And then when Jacob was in the womb, he called him. Even Jeremiah is a prophet. In the womb, the Lord called him. Right? And so God has a plan. He calls you. And he calls you out of darkness into light. We read that in Colossians 1. What do we learn next? We learn that we are justified by faith in Christ's person and work. And this is exactly what we see in the pattern of redemption. Genesis 15, right? Let's just turn and read that. Actually, I want to read, let's go from Genesis 15 to Galatians 3. I want to just show this connection. Genesis 15. Remember, we're in God's covenant with Abram. The Lord has already made the covenant with Abram in chapter 12. You have the great war of the kings, right, in chapter 14. Then Abram goes and rescues Lot, who was taken among all of those. He brings him back. Abram gets blessed by Melchizedek at the end of chapter 14. Chapter 15, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. If you're not Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. He's just reiterating the covenants, what he's already promised him years before. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. You said I would have offspring. I still continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. Now this has always been God's plan. Right? But he... He clarifies as history unfolds, as Abram is able to receive it. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Now, what I want you to see is, in those few words, which is just a reiteration of what the Lord had said to Abram in chapter 12, what has God just done? Very, very simply, he's preached the gospel. The gospel is about Christ and the cross, always. But in its Old Testament typical form, in types and shadows, this is what it looks like, right? Because you can't give it away until it comes, right? You can't give the cross away. You can't give the incarnation away. You can't give the atonement away 
until it comes. At this point, there isn't even a message of, you know, a very clear message of atonement, right? Because that doesn't come until the Aaronic priesthood, until captivity, until the shedding of blood, right? When Israel is brought out of Egypt and passed over, for what reason? Because of blood that was shed on their behalf. Now you can talk about atonement, right? You see, it has to be, it has to be typed out in history, and then the Lord explains it. So he preaches the gospel. So shall your offspring be. That's it. Look at verse 6. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And Paul picks up on this in Romans chapter 4. Abraham believed God. What did he believe? Right? There's no salvation. Right? Faith doesn't save unless it's faith in the gospel. Right? Remember we saw this in Mark 9. It's the object of faith that saves. And what the Bible is telling us is the gospel is there. Now look what Paul does with that in Galatians 3. Very, very interesting. This is why it's important to read the Bible as a whole and not just get stuck in the New Testament. We need to understand the whole of Scripture. And that's been the point of this study. So, in Galatians 3, verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ, in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. I need to back up here. Um, verse 7. Know then, that it is, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Abraham's the father of the faithful. He teaches us. His life shows us that salvation is by faith in the promised gospel of God. So those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, Paul says, foreseeing these days, because that's when the Gentiles are justified by faith, only in the New Testament. Foreseeing these days, God preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed, which is the wording in, in Genesis 12. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So Paul says, the gospel was preached to Abraham, right, that he might be saved. And he believed that gospel. And as one who came to salvation through believing the gospel, he is the father of all who come to salvation through believing the gospel. Now that gospel becomes much more clear as time unfolds, even just through the Old Testament. But certainly with the New Testament, that gospel is, more, is most clear. And what happens when we believe it? We're justified. Look at letter D. The next thing we learn from scriptures, we're adopted. Right? We're adopted into God's family as co-heirs with Christ. Romans 8. Right? We have received not the spirit of slavery, but the spirit of adoption that we might cry, Abba, Father. Romans 8, Galatians 4. Now I'll turn to Exodus 19 and let's be reminded here what the Lord says to Israel. Again, in the pattern of redemption laid out in history, we're being shown how God saves Exodus 19, verse 3, The Lord called to Moses out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel. Now he's just brought them out of Egypt. They've traveled through the wilderness a bit. They come through the Red Sea. They've come finally to Sinai. We're about three months in. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Exit and entry. I brought you out of Egypt to bring you to myself. Now, therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. See what the Lord says, right? Again, grace, we said this a couple of weeks ago, grace is free. God went into Egypt freely. But grace, coming to sinners, puts sinners under obligation. To believe, to obey, to heed the call, to come. Grace comes to you for free. But if you turn the other way, you bear your own guilt. But as it comes, what does it do? It calls and it says, come to me. Believe upon me, right? Repent and believe the gospel. And so God adopts Israel and brings them. And so we learn that in the next stage of our salvation. Then, of course, our sanctification. We learn our sanctification is by faith in Christ's person and work. And God talks about this in Exodus 36. I'll give you a new heart, new spirit, my spirit, and I will cause you to walk in my statutes. God tells Israel, I've saved you, and I will sanctify you. And that's exactly what we learn in the New Testament 
when the work of the Holy Spirit is laid out most fully. And where does it all end? It ends in our glorification. By faith in Christ's person and work, we are ultimately glorified. First Thessalonians 1.10 Christ Jesus saves us from the wrath that is to come. And at the consummation, letter G, finally, what do we learn from Revelation 21 and 22? We shall forever be with the Lord as his people in his place with his presence. This is where God is going. This is what God is doing. So now what have we seen then? Redemptive history is carried out in the New Testament in the lives of people who come to Christ by saving faith. So that Abraham is our father, right? The father of the faithful. Galatians 3, we become children of Abraham. We're joined, we receive the promise. We are heirs of the very promise God made to Abraham. Why Abraham? We're not Jews. Because it wasn't about being Jewish. It was about believing the gospel. And if we believe the gospel, Paul says in Galatians 3, we get the same promise that Abraham got, which is what? The promise, Galatians 3 says, of the Holy Spirit. Glorious, right? See the full picture, now it all comes together. It's what God's been doing all along. And that's why we are able to move through the New Testament, even as the New Testament is so much shorter, you move through it so much more quickly. Because all the groundwork has been laid, and when Christ comes and he starts doing things, we understand exactly what he, all, all, all John has to say is, Behold the Lamb of God. All Christ has to say is, This cup is my blood of the covenant. These, the language that's being used in the New Testament to describe the work of Christ. And even as the apostles write, and they point to various images, and they point to various events in the Old Testament, all that freight comes with it. They don't need to re-explain because it's already been done through history. God's already shown and revealed, and that freight comes to bear upon the now, the full gospel, the finished gospel. Here is the Lamb, and Jesus says, I will raise this temple in three days. All that imagery comes to bear. He's the temple of God. He's the Son of God. He's the Israel of God. And the Holy Spirit dwells in the church as God's people. Right? The Old Testament has done all the work. The New Testament receives the benefit. Right? So... Amen. Any questions or thoughts? We've skipped a lot there. I hope you'll take the time to look up those verses, but just a, just more reiteration. Any questions? Let me highlight just one more thing uh, before we close. <clears throat> look at uh, justification there. I made mention of this this morning in Sunday school, and it's here. In our justification, right, number one, all the promises of the Old Testament have been fulfilled for us in Christ. So here you have justification. This highlights what Christ has done for us, right? And then letter E, in our sanctification, we highlight what Christ has done, what Christ is doing in and among us. And then letter F, our glorification, all the promises of the Old Testament will be fulfilled. It says in us, that should be with us. That's where you have that third. So you have for us, in and among us, and then with us in the whole creation. So all of redemptive history, Christ is doing things. Christ has done things for us. So that there's a sense in which when we talk about the gospel, right? It's like talking about saved. We have been saved. We are being saved. We will be saved. There's three, three ways to think about salvation. There's three ways to think about what Christ has done. There's some things that Christ has done for us. They can't be repeated. They need not be repeated. They're done. It is finished. There are things which Christ is doing in us now, right? And then when Christ comes again, there are things that Christ will do with us. Because what does he say of us? We're co-heirs. We'll reign. We'll be seated with him. We'll live with him, dwell with him, see his glory. All those things will be done with us in time to come in the consummation. So I want to highlight that because we'll come back to this next week when we take our final lesson where we live now is this in us period. Things have been done for us and don't need to be repeated. Things shall be done with us. They're guaranteed because of what's done for us. This is surely to come. But we live in this in us time. right? Sanctification. What's happening now is our sanctification. right? Our justification is finished. Our glorification is coming. We're living in this period of sanctification when we and the whole creation... Right, are enjoying the work of the Holy Spirit as he is sanctifying and preparing and making us fit for glory when glory will come down and Christ will dwell with his church forever. So I just want you to keep that image in mind because we'll come back to that. All right. Any questions? Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Lord, we just stand in awe before you.
seems that every Sunday, Lord, we just end with thanks. What a, what a blessing to be in your house. What a blessing to be with your people and to receive the means of grace. We rejoice in the good news of the gospel. We rejoice that you have made yourself known and that you have declared these things unto us so clearly in the scriptures and that we are able to read and to study and to learn. We're able to dig in, Lord, and take our time walking through the pages of scripture and grasping all of these wonderful truths, Lord, of things that have been done, things that are being done even now and things that will yet that are yet to be done. We rejoice in the inseparable connection between these realities because Christ is the doer of it all and he is already on the throne. Oh, Father, we bless you and thank you for such a Savior. Thank you for your word and the blessing of this day. We pray that we would go forth now into this week, that you'd be with us as we go about our work and we tend to those things, you know, the Lord you've given us to do, that we take up our responsibilities and our obligations and our opportunities. We pray that in it all, we would live as redeemed people. We would walk before you and live with a clear conscience before God and men. Forgive us now, we ask once again, O oh God, of our many sins. Forgive us, O Lord, wash, cleanse, and pardon us. Give us the joy of our salvation, the assurance of, of peace and reconciliation with you. And send us forth, we ask, as witnesses in this world to bear testimony to the good things of God, our Savior, in Jesus Christ. We ask all this tonight in his name. Amen.